and I thank you all so much for coming tonight and supporting this year's Galaxy. Um, we're super excited that James Fesh for the new Sigma Force novel, Demon Crown. Um, so let's give him a round of applause. And I'm going to yell really loudly. <laughs> so eventually, I'll, my voice will go lower and lower. So I'm just speaking to this woman right here. <laughs> None of you. So be prepared for that. So if I get a little, little soft spoken in the back and can't hear me, uh, raise your hand. I'll probably still ignore you, but uh, hopefully we'll identify it. First of all, thank you for coming out. I know it's a very busy season this time of year. Everybody's got a thousand obligations with family and shopping and. So to just spend some time with me here, I really appreciate that very much. Appreciate you being here. Now I see many, many faces I've seen many, many times. <laughs> How many people have not heard me speak before? Who are you? Goodness gracious. <laughs> I'm debating whether to skip over the how that became the author talk as an introduction myself. Maybe I'll do a shortened version of it. Okay, please. Sure. <laughs> please. <laughs> then I'll talk about the novel, then I'll open up for Q&A, because I don't know what they always say. I don't know why anybody shows up at any of my signings. Hopefully the Q&A you will, you will tell me why you're here. <laughs> Does it feel like I'm yelling at you? I feel like no. I'm, no. I feel like I'm going to start swearing at any point because I just feel like I'm yelling. <laughs> Me? <laughs> uh, so I'll start out with talking about myself a little bit about how that became an author, talk about the book, oh, for QA. So, um, the poorly kept secret I'm a veterinarian. How many people that raised their hand and never heard me speak before did not know I was a veterinarian? I'm a veterinarian. <laughs> <laughs> How big? That's a, that is a giant dog. He's a veterinarian. I always resent with somebody. Yeah, I've done interviews occasionally where I get introduced. You know, James Rollins. You know, author of the Sigma series, former veterinarian. I resent that. Yeah. I'm not a former veterinarian. I can still neuter a cat in under 30 seconds. <laughs> Somebody has a loose feline, I'll prove it right now. <laughs> I'll never give up that profession. If you've ever read my books, you probably know I like animals because I populate books with a lot of animals from military working dogs to Western Mountain Gorillas to search and rescue wolves and all sorts of different types of animals. Because that was my first love. You know, I always wanted to be a veterinarian. I got that assignment. You get some time in third grade. I explained this before to people that have heard me before. Put your heads down. You've heard this already. <laughs> I feel like a comedian that does the same joke over and over again. Let me just talk about it. Who, who raised their hand before? Slide back. Okay, so I got an assignment in third grade. You always get some point in your elementary school years. Teacher said, go home, write a little essay, tell us what you want to be when you grow up. You don't want to be that. One problem, you didn't know how to spell veterinarian. <laughs> so the point of moral dilemma. Sat on my dad's blank sheet paper in front of me. Knew I wanted to put veterinarian in there. Not know how to spell it. I could put policeman, I could put fireman, and go out and play. <laughs> but I did the one thing all third graders hate to do. Got the dictionary, looked it up. That determined third grade to be a vet. Let's move that story a little forward. First day of vet school. I was uh, accepted into the University of Missouri Columbia Veterinary School. First day, entering class is seated. Dean walks in, gives the introductory speech. Ends his speech with chilling words you probably also remember from your school years. Take out a sheet of paper, you're having your first pop quiz, no yeah. question quiz, you get it wrong with kicking you out of vet school, <laughs> write down the word veterinarian. <laughs> Third grade, we're ready for that one. Not all my classmates were ex-classmates, I should say. But okay, that's this side, loves animals, loves medicine. I got this side more twisted, more weird. As I explained before, I blame this side of my family. This on my family. I was raised with three brothers and three sisters. So it's all just math. My parents had seven kids. We were raised Polish, Roman Catholic. You get the Polish flag in your window, you have to have six kids. <laughs> I'm gonna spare. Okay, something happened. But with that many siblings, I also had a built-in audience for my storytelling. My mom called it lying. I called it storytelling. <laughs> my goal was to terrorize my younger brothers with sister, uh, sisters with uh, horrible tales. If tears were involved, all the better. 
pretty much what I do today. Try to scare you. The scares are involved, the better. Um, I've done talks before. I've done the. Event. I was going to try to give an example for the few of you that haven't read me before uh, about uh, for my for my uh, formative years. An example of my storytelling ability. Do you want to hear that again? Yes. Yeah, I've done the veterinary. I mean, I've done the uh, the other the 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 ventriloquist style story. Did you? Did you ever do Carrie and the Martian story? No. Has anyone heard the Martian story? No. no. How many people have heard the ventriloquist story? No. No. You are lying. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was a liar in this room. <laughs> Might be the only skilled liar. I was the ventriloquist. When I, when I start telling you, you're going to start nodding. Okay. So, besides veterinarian, I had another career goal, also with the letter V, ventriloquist. I innately knew I was going to be the child prodigy of the ventriloquism world. I was going to tour the globe, earning vast sums of money. Only problem, didn't have a ventriloquist doll. <laughs> Only hiccup of my plans. So I begged and pleaded with my folks, you know, oh, I need this doll, I'll buy you a new house as soon as I'm touring. <laughs> so finally, wheeling, they finally broke down on one Christmas, they got me a ventriloquist doll. Now, is, a, is Charlie McCarthy doll, you remember Charlie McCarthy? Yes. You know, yeah. Creepy in and of itself, that doll. Yeah. <laughs> and it came with a little 45 uh, RPM. For the youngsters in the crowd, it's a record. <laughs> Edgar Bergen teaching you how to throw your voice. I practiced. I mean, I tried. I mean, I, I practiced, I studied for all about three minutes. And I realized this is not a career goal for me. I like to move my lips when I talk. So, what am I going to do with this doll I've been begging for for X number of months? So, I get an idea. It's getting creepy. <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> Be prepared. Don't cry. <laughs> so I, I got an idea. So I go to my bookshelf. I'm an avid reader. You probably can guess that, girl, you know, being a writer. And on my bookshelf, I had a copy of Lord of the Rings. <gasps> the last book of Lord of the Rings is Return of the King. Mm -hmm. And the appendix of, third, of Return of the King is a bunch of uh, uh, Elvish script and Nordic rune examples. So I copy some of that down. Crinkle the pages. Point the edges of the match. <laughs> So you've heard this, right? No. 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 <laughs> so I fold that piece of paper up, I stick it in the pocket of the doll. Okay. Later that night. Now, I don't think I explained this before. I'm 11 years old at this point. I'm sharing a bro my, my bedroom with my brother Chuck. He's eight. <laughs> so later that night, I'm in my bed. Chuck's at his bed. Doll's on the bureau. I say, Chuck, something's sticking out of the pocket of the doll. Can you see what that is? <laughs> All right. So he takes it, open it, unwraps it. I don't know, Jim. It's some weird paper and it looks really old and there's some scribbling on it. That's really odd. What? How'd that get done? Great, right, Chuck, this page does look old. But I'd actually say it might be ancient. <laughs> and this isn't just scribbling. I think this is writing. It is? Yeah. I think I've seen this before. You have? Yeah. Let me do a little bit of research, Chuck. Okay. So then I do research, put it on my bookshelf, put the books over my shoulder, until I get to a course. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it, Return of the King. Flip to the back, look, check it's the same writing. It is! I mean, check, I think I can translate this. You can, yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd be lost in incantation. It might be a uh, secret to a treasure. Then do it. Okay, Chuck, I will. <laughs> so I begin translating it. Chuck, the first word's coming clear. Beware. Well, that's ominous. Beware, after midnight, I rise and hunt for blood. <laughs> Jim, do you think that's real? Looks real, doesn't it? <laughs> this is a precaution. Let's just fold that note back up. Let's stick it back in the pocket of the doll. Maybe you didn't know we read it. As an extra precaution, let's make sure that night that thing's locked up. Let's reinforce that. Chuck, did you put the doll in the closet? I think so. Did you push the closet door straight? Just click shut. We don't want it pushing and getting us tonight. Just reinforce that for a few weeks, and the fun begins. Okay, about 2 o'clock in the morning, take the doll out of the closet, stick it under my brother's blankets. <laughs> wait for morning. Required changing a few sheets, but... <laughs> worth it. So that's the side of my brain, a little weird, a little more twisted. But what was my career track going to be? You know, I, I, I thought, you know, gosh, it would be really cool sometime maybe to walk in the bookstore and find a, my own book on the shelf. That would be really neat. 
But I thought, you know, if I do this, this, and this, I could become a veterinarian. If I do this, this, and this, I can fail horribly as a writer. <laughs> I'm going this track. <clears throat> but I continued to read. And that's like throwing gasoline on the side of my brain. And so I kept thinking, one of these days I'll write, one of these days I'll write. And eventually graduated and got my own clinic. And I found a little bit of time where I might be able to fit writing in. So I started fitting writing into it. Just short stories. That's all I thought I could fit. I wrote a bunch of short stories. They're buried in my backyard. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you read them. <laughs> Collected a lot of rejections for those short stories. I was determined. Any magazine that would vaguely might be connected to the story I wrote, I was making them read it. And they rejected it. So based upon that experience, I decided I was going to write my novel. And clearly, I was prepared. <laughs> First novel I wrote. It took me 11 months. Doing three pages a day. Double space pages, five by seven days a week, not crazy. <laughs> Began collecting more rejections. 49 agents rejected that first novel until a 50th agent, not running up around and down, the five year old 50th agent saw something in that rough draft to want to represent it. And I thought she was crazy. So I had 49 other verifiable proof that this was not worthy of being published. And most of the rejections, by the way, if you are any authors out there, uh, uh, you know, the, the rejection is just form letters nowadays. They're like, Dear Sir, Ma'am, we hate your novel. Do <laughs> it again. <laughs> editor. But occasionally, some editor might give you a little pat on the back. They'll write some message to you. You know, Jim, I like that one character in this book. It's a shame the rest of your novel fall flat on its face. <laughs> <laughs> Decline. <laughs> I'll tell you one example of one of those passing back. So, you know, I get that form rejection letter from a St. Martin's Press editor. Disappointing. But I see that he has written me a personal note in the back. Just three words of encouragement. This is unpublishable. <laughs> I respected that because not only did he reject me, but took extra special time to kick me in the nuts besides. <laughs> so, but like I said, that 50th agent that taught something, uh, she got a little bit of rejection, but eventually she found a home for it. And then one novel became two, and then two became four. My clients at the clinic became suspicious. You know. Most because of the like, posters in the lobby here, Cat Spade, get a free book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Questions that you know, started to occur across the uh, exam room table. You know, Dr. Jim, you have this successful veterinary hospital. What's this writing business you're doing? What's your long-term goal in life? I go, that's awfully... Uh, Awfully nosy for somebody that's straining your anal glands. By trying to answer that, the dog's anal glands. Did I say dog's anal glands? I need to make sure. Veterinary, remember. So, so let me. I'll try to explain that. I, you know, 15 years veterinary medicine was my paycheck, and writing was just a hobby. It really wasn't making very much money off of uh, my initial writing. Uh, but maybe down the line, the distance, it'd be really cool to flip that around and have <clears throat> writing be my paycheck and veterinary medicine just be my hobby. And like I said, I, I still do, uh, I can still neuter that cat in under 30 seconds. Why I can do that is I still uh, work with a group called Sacramento Council of Cats. They track cats along with Sacramento Valley. One Sunday a month for eight hours, I stay new to them. So basically all I now do about the veterinary degree is just remove genitalia. It's <laughs> <laughs> a hobby. So I've achieved that goal. So that's my hobby. I write now for a living. That's how that became an author. It was not that linear. There's many ups and downs. In buried in there was a lie. I'm not going to tell you which was a lie. Figure it out yourself. The end of three minutes, thing. Thirty seconds. Oh no, I can do that in thirty seconds. That's right. <laughs> those, those balls come off really easy. <laughs> Spades a little harder. Take a little longer. It was, it was that transition of what made me right? I won't tell you about how that is. That's embarrassing. So um, we'll leave it that day anymore. Any, any questions about that? You know, if there's any writers out there that want some details, you know, we'll, we'll cover that in the Q and A. I just want to talk about the book a little bit and then go into those Q and A's. I'm always challenged on how to talk about a book because I kind of walk a little bit of a tightrope. Because if I talk too much about the novel and give too much of it away, then you're going to go, well, now I know the story. Don't leave my book. <laughs> if I don't give you enough information, you go, well, that's not interesting. I don't want the book. <laughs> so I've got to walk this tightrope that leads right to that cash register. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what we have to do today. And so I devised a scheme. Uh, several books ago, and I've been using it for a while, by answering a question about this novel that if I don't answer it now anyways, they're going to ask it during the Q&A, and we'll get it out of the way, because we hate this question. If everyone wants to make an author cringe, walk up to him and ask them this question. Everyone want to guess? <laughs> see, you mm -hmm. did hear this before. Yeah, that one. Yeah, see. But you've been a veterinarian. I mean, the veterinarian story? No. I've sworn I've done that many times here. No. 
You know, Ray, you so each other remember what happened last week. I don't either, so. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you get your ideas from? We hate that. Oh. Yeah. Because we don't know. And we're afraid. If you make us look at the process, it's going to evaporate and go away. And I don't have enough talent for that to happen. <laughs> now, I thought that was just me. Let's go back a little bit for a moment in time. For, uh, Subterranean was just about to come out, my first book, that one that was rejected by that, those 50 different agents. Yeah. Two months from release, I thought, I don't know how to do a book signing. I've never done a book signing before. It's my first book. I attended book signings, but I really didn't pay that much attention. I just enjoyed it. But now I thought I should go do some book signings and take notes. So during those two months, I just thought, who's coming to town? I'm going to attend a book signing. So I attended this, and I'll leave this author unnamed. Uh, it's a mystery writer. If you know the alphabet, you might guess who she is. But that's all I said. <laughs> so I attended her talk, and wonderful speaker, warm, personable. Question came up about, you know, during the Q&A, where, where do you get your ideas from? And her, her response was just eloquent. It was, it was mystical about her own inner self, and shining a light in the darkness. And <laughs> Very inspiring. And I'm thinking, I don't do any of that. So clearly I'm doing this wrong. <laughs> but it's still impressive. So I waited in line to get to the front of the table and said, hey, you know, unknown author, uh, I was really impressed by your talk and especially where you got your ideas out. That, that was really cool. You know, I've got a book coming out in a couple months and, and then she cuts me off right there with the hand. I said, wait, you know what? Do you have a book coming out in two months? Yeah, I have it's coming from Harper Collins. I'm very excited about it. She says, something forward. She goes, made it up. <laughs> no idea where my ideas from. <laughs> but you're going to get that question asked at every book sign. <laughs> Prepare an answer. I go, Can I take yours? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm going to try to explain where this came from. Where I got my ideas from this book. As a general overview, I'm always collecting ideas for stories. I got my little antenna up, looking for something that might be a, a seed for a story. I'm typically looking for three things. I'm looking for, you know, a historical mystery, a piece of history that has some question marks that I can solve within the pages of the novel. Then on this side, I'm looking for that science that makes me go, "What if? Where's that headed? How might that challenge us?" I'm also looking for then like locations that I can crash those two things together. As a consequence, I subscribe at this point. I counted before I left. Uh, it's 24 different magazines. There's 22 last year. It's 24 this year. Whenever I see something in one of those magazines, I cut the article out, I throw it in a box. If I'm watching Discovery Channel, National Geographic Channel, something interesting pops up there, make a note, throw it in the box. If I'm traveling, I'm notorious for walking up to somebody in a strange town and going, hey, tell me a secret about this place. Tell me something that nobody knows about your village. And surprisingly, they tell you. <laughs> All right? The nuclear code for what? <laughs> Into the box. Now, as you, as you can well imagine, with that much inflow, it would be very easy for one box to become two, two to four, and it's like Jane Groans on orders. We don't want that. It's <laughs> got to stay to one box. That was a commitment to myself. But to stay to one box, I have to go through it every now and again and look for ideas that no longer interest me. Maybe, you know, another author's handled that topic, I can throw it away. Maybe the science is old, so it's no longer, no longer current, I can throw it away. But what happens in those moments, that bit of serendipity, a little bit of magic, I don't know why this happens, is that this piece of history and this piece of science will end up on the floor at the same time or my hand at the same time and only then, never in my own fed imagination would I have ever connected those two, but because they end up just next to each other, they go, oh, that could make a story. And then like a jigsaw puzzle, I'll see if they'll fit. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. If they don't, they go back in the box. If they do, I'll research and see if it will load up into a, a good story. And that's why I want to write. I wish I had control over that. I don't. I secretly fear someone's going to break into my house, steal my box, my career is over. <laughs> I don't believe I get that. So I'm going to tell you, for this novel, to describe this novel, I'm going to tell you what came out of that box. That's all I'm going to tell you. Because again. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a little bit of the history, a little bit of the science, and you'll get an idea how weird my process is, both in, in constructing a novel, and particularly some of the details of this book. I now have to turn my back on you all. Excuse me. This is exactly how this book came to be. Nobody peek. <laughs> so I, you know, when I travel, I collect a bunch of, you know, tchotchkes and junk that accumulates. So this has been sitting on my desk for eight years. I purchased this in a trip to Tallinn, Estonia. It's a chunk of amber. Now those are back. 
I'm afraid I'm going to drop this on you. Yeah. <laughs> Very slowly. You can't see from where you're sitting, but if you know, come up when you get your book signed, you'll be able to see and you know, hint, hint, get your book signed. There's a little beer wasp uh, stuck in this amber from 100,000 years ago. Now, innately, I knew it was evil. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with them. So for eight years, he sat as a paperweight on my desk, just holding papers down. That was the purpose of this evil loss. But then things began accumulating in my box. You know, I, I start this novel, I'm not reading it because it's right in the first line, by positing the question, what is the most dangerous animal, the most deadly animal on the planet? It's a mosquito. A mosquito causes millions of deaths every year. Not particularly a good little bug. In fact, every year, one out of 60 people in the globe dies from insects. Not just mosquitoes, but all the other insects, the assassin bugs, bees, allergic reactions. And it's not just us. In that box was some notes from a novel, not a novel, a non-fiction book I had read by a group of scientists, a pair of scientists who hypothesized that the actual cause of the dis extinction of the dinosaurs was not that asteroid. Yes, the asteroid you know, probably debilitated them, but the death blow to the dinosaurs, insects. They predated upon those weakened dinosaurs, and that was actually what killed them. <laughs> Just more recently, in the last couple of years, I have a lot of contact in various governmental cir cir circles uh, over at DARPA, different military groups. They, again, tell me some things I'm sure they're not supposed to be telling me. <laughs> I still write them down. <laughs> so I, I got a dossier that was prepared by Homeland Security. It was something that was like interdepartmental, just shared with them, but I got a copy of it. And it listed their top 10 concerns for national security. Things that keep Homeland Security up at night. And the usual suspects were there, you know, chemical attack, nuclear attack. But in that top five was something that surprised me. And that was the threat of invasive species. Foreign invasive species. You're all familiar with like the uh, the pythons that got loose in the Everglades or run the place. Just recently there was an article about a 17 foot long yeah. python that was discovered. Secretly, I think Disney is slowly terraforming the Everglades into the next theme park, yeah. <laughs> their version of yeah. Jurassic Park. Yeah. And this is just that process. <laughs> you will admit it eventually. But there's also many other species, Asian carp invading our lakes and streams, competing with the native fish populations. But what keeps Homeland Security up at night is what if a hostile power decides to weaponize an invasive species and purposefully and maliciously releases it across the U.S.? Why their concern is that we have almost no safeguard against that because the threat can come from so many different directions. So there's no way of protecting our shores from that. And as with the python and the carps, once something, a species like that gets established, it's almost impossible to get rid of them. <laughs> now, oddly enough, I'm wondering, how did it make the top five? What does Homeland Security know that they're not telling us? <laughs> they know some lab somewhere in the world that is doing that, because well, how did it make the top five? That's surprising. me. So that was one of the purposes in, in going through this novel, was exploring it. Well, what would happen if something like that actually happens? So that's the science by the novel, because it sounds very throwing at something. I'm going to jump over to the history really briefly. Can anybody tell me where Sigma Force is headquartered? Under, under the Smithsonian Castle. There are actually some World War II bunkers beneath the castle. Uh, those, are, those exist. Uh, I, I envision that uh, Sigma Force uh, uh, took over those, those uh, bunkers. That's where they're headquartered. Um, as I mentioned, this gentleman right over here. Uh, I, I visit the Smithsonian many times. I, I'm at the castle quite frequently. I'm usually knocking on doors. You know, hello, great. Are you there? <laughs> I secretly suspect at some point DARPA will uh, just to a surprise James Rollins. We'll actually invent Sigma Force, put them down there. So I'm not going to always gray there, so they'll yeah, what do you want? Just to see my expression. But as you can well imagine, because of uh, Sigma Force, you know, this is the 13th novel in the Sigma Force universe, uh, that I've done a lot of research. So I've, again, uh, probably half of that box is full of stuff about the Smithsonian. Little details, little, little cool little tidbits. And there's a mystery surrounding the Smithsonian. It goes back to the founding 
of, this, of the Smithsonian. Now, many people aren't aware that the Smithsonian is named after an individual. His name is James Smithson, and he's Smithsonian. He was a British geologist slash chemist. He left his vast fortune to the United States to, to construct an institute of higher learning and scholarly study. What's odd is that he never set foot in the U.S. Yet he left his fortune to us. He never told anybody he was going to do that. It surprised his nephew who was sitting there like this. <laughs> he was very disappointed. Why did he do that? The mystery deepens. During the Civil War, a mysterious fire breaks out at the Smithsonian Castle. Destroys a part of the castle. Why so little is known about James Smithson, the scientist? Remember, he was a chemist and a geologist. He was one of the youngest members to be recruited by the British uh, Society of, of, of Scientists. And, uh, but we don't know very little from, of, 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 of James Smithson, the scientist. And why? Because during that fire, it seemed to wipe out all, it wiped out all of his papers. Because James Smithson left his research journals, his field notebooks to the Smithsonian. So they were stored there, they were destroyed, as was his vast mineral collection that he, that he also donated to the Smithsonian, destroyed. It was almost like that fire purposely wiped out his heritage. Odd. Mr. Deepens yet again. And this next part is true, it's always surprised. This surprised me and it surprised a lot of people. 80 years later, Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, decides, let's go get the bones of James Smithson. <laughs> Smithsonian's regions go, why? That sounds like a stupid plan. <laughs> but I don't care, I'm going to do it. So he and his wife, at their own expense, hopped on a steamship, traveled over to Italy. Uh, James Smithson was buried, he died in, in Italy, and was buried in Genoa, Italy. Once he reached the shore, he bribed officials, he lied, he told everybody that President Theodore Roosevelt had sent him on this mission. <laughs> Not true. Then <laughs> on a snowy New Year's Eve, in 1903, he broke into James Smithson's tomb, secured the skeletal remains of James Smithson, put it in a zinc coffin, transferred that coffin back to the United States, where those uh, remains now are interred at this, the Smithsonian Castle. So, you know, why all that skullduggery? In this case, real skullduggery. <laughs> why did he leave his fortune to us? Was well, there some ulterior purpose behind that fire? I know. <laughs> and for twenty-four ninety-nine, so can you. <laughs> so that's the history. That's the sign. I have to connect. All I will do is add one more warning. Uh, my my editor read this book. Said, oh my God, this is your, you know, the most frightening book you've ever wrote. And it is gruesome. I need to warn you that at some point in this novel, you are going to see Kowalski's naked butt. <laughs> Quite gruesome. <laughs> I don't mean just reading about it. You're going to see Kowalski's naked butt. So PG-13. <laughs> so that is The Demon Crown in a nutshell. Like I said, I'm not going to tell you much more because I want you to find the book. But I will, of course, answer many questions that you have and you would like to share. Anybody? I'm going to keep talking until somebody raises a hand. Thank you, sir. I I'm always fearful that I'm going to, I do that all the time. I'm going to keep talking until someone answers this question. I'm serious at some point, you're all going to get together before I talk, and whatever you do, don't raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> if we can get James Rollins to talk. <laughs> yes. You have Jim. Yes. Um, you've you written 14 of the series. 13. 13. 13. 13. Yep. Yeah. Your last three, I think, have really, they've all been good. The last three have really been superior, starting with a seven, and then going with a stone, Thanks. And then with the bone, and then this one here. Thanks, Dad. This one. Right, right. And what did you say about the cover? The it's a beautiful cover. cover. It's beautiful. Yeah, they did give me some, some nice yeah. covers. I, yeah, you know, it, everybody asks me, do I, do I add, do I, is that in my input in these covers? Yeah. Or do I contribute to the covers? And of course I do. You know, yeah. who, what author wouldn't? Yeah, you know, they always consult me. And they, they question whether I like it or not. And I've learned over the years that the only answer is I love it. <laughs> Any other response? Make no difference. <laughs> I have actually no input. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you feel about your Thank collaboration you. books versus the Sigma series? They were fun. I mean, they're different birds. Uh, I've generally done two books a year for the entire part of my career. It's always been like a Sigma novel and something else. I've done standalones. I've done uh, young adult, middle middle school uh, books. And I decided, well, let's 
so what, you know, I got this idea for a vampire series, and I never collaborated before. I knew I'm not really a vampire type of guy, and, and I could bring the weird science and the, and the animals, but I need somebody that can bring some gothic quality. So I know Rebecca since before she was ever published, and uh, she took a uh, she was a student of mine at a writers retreat, so I knew her before. From then to when she was published, gave her the first blur, blah blah blah. blah. And uh, so I called Rebecca and said, Hey, Rebecca, you know. What you do with your novels is these historical mysteries is sort of what I need. I need the sort of got the quality to the story idea I have, and you know maybe you know if you bring your skill and I bring my skill, we can do this really cool version of this idea I have. You know what's the story about? Is it about vampires? She would know. <laughs> no interest in that at all. I go, I didn't either. Well, let me tell you about it. And I went to the sort of back history of the story. By the time I was on the conversation, she was like, Oh, yeah, let's do that. So different birds, it, totally different. We did, neither of us had collaborated. It was a weird process. Uh, you don't want to judge during an executioner of my own work. When you have a, a collaborator, it's almost like right by committee. And so every Monday for about four to six hours, we would communicate via Skype. She was living in, in uh, Hawaii at that time. The second book, she moved to Berlin. I can get further away from you. <laughs> so we, you know, exchange chapters, talk about, you know, what worked, what didn't. We were headed, headed initially, because neither of us collaborated, it was awkward. I was like, you know, Rebecca, I, I, I see what you did with this chapter. Um, it's really good. Uh, but there's one section here, um, not really sure, you know, I have a suggestion, you don't have to do it, I'm just suggesting maybe that we do maybe this way. But eventually I got down to, Jim, this sucks, write this again. <laughs> Once we got to that point, things got to get much smoother, but initially it took a while to figure out how to do that. And it's fun, because yeah. normally, besides being a judge during execution of my own work, I've got to figure everything out. And it's nice having two brains to solve one problem. You know, I'm notorious for painting my characters in the corner, which I'd love to do. And I just hand it to Rebecca here. Exactly. Exactly. So it was fine. Yes, sir. Is there uh, any uh, debate going to the uh, naming of the novels at all uh, between you and your your editor? It's like Demon Crown is perfect, or you you have a, a different. Uh, Thing that you guys tossed about? I would say probably like nine times out of ten, whatever my working title is, we end up using. But sometimes they go, well, you know, we'll talk to the marketing department, that really wasn't, they didn't work too keen on that. Can you give us like three or four alternatives? So I'll give them three or four alternatives that they'll present that to the marketing department and they'll settle on one, settle on one of them. The only one that, that didn't work on was Black Order. Black Order was not supposed to be named Black Order. That was just the name of my file. And I turned it into my editor. So I'm just like, well, we'll talk about you know, titles later on. And then it, and you know, came around as here's your cover, Black Order. <laughs> that's not the name. That's, a, that's not very exciting. So that was. Sometimes you have to be careful with that. So what was the original name? Well, oh, that was uh, we didn't debate it. I mean, that was that was the working title on my little. What would you call it? Though? I don't know. Demon Crown. Nazis go wild. <laughs> 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 yes. After they stole Smithson's body. Yes. What? Who put it under the castle? Who, who put it in the castle? It? Did other people know, or did you oh, yeah, no, no, no. there? No, no. Did He's, they make any he, big deal about he, it? Yeah, they did. Yeah, there was a big. Not parade, but there was a big announcement of bringing his yeah, remains. Yeah, so exactly. once they secured them, then they like, oh yeah, you know, let's <laughs> let's make it a thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it wasn't like they just you know dug it. A couple it was of just this, yeah. It was just no, they actually they, they actually brought his whole tomb over mm -hmm. to. So the the tomb that's sitting in the Smithsonian Castle was a tomb that was sitting in the Genoa, mm -hmm. Italy graveyard. Huh. Yeah. And why they wanted to, why Alexander <coughs> wanted to secure that was that the Italians were about to take, about to there was a. Uh, a mine, a, uh, I can't think of what the word I'm thinking of right now, a quarry right next to the uh, to the cemetery. They want to expand it, the quarry and take down the cemetery. So they, they were going to just destroy any graves unless the, all, unless the family members wanted to do something with their bodies, they were just going to get rid of them. So weird. Yes, sir. You, the Sigma has always been in the Smithsonian Castle, but you're taking this opportunity now to go deeper into it. Right. And coincidentally, Steve Barry's last book focused yes. on that, and I know you guys are friends. Do you talk about that? We did. Before you do it? I and wish like would have. Purposefully <laughs> arrange it that way, or was it coincidence? I, was working, I was working on this novel, and I knew I knew Steve was working on something with you know the Golden Circle and some type of lost gold. He always looked for lost gold, money, money, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but 
that's all I knew about the story. I didn't get much more detail than that until I was reading the Amazon description of his novel. Now, that sounds. What's he tripping? You know, that's my territory. <laughs> so I, I emailed him saying, hey, you know, I, I think we're treading on the same ground. And so I said, what, can you just tell me what you're working? You know, what part of this story you're dealing with? And so we split down the middle. So I thought, okay, you can have the fire <laughs> and all that stuff. I'm going to deal with this cabal scientist and Alexander Graham Bell and the, with the, the you know, breaking into his tomb part of the story. So we sort of decided who was going to take which part of that story. So there was a little bit of collaboration there. Yes? The second book was Amber Rube. That was Steve's second, second book. Second book? No, it was his first book. Was it his first book? Yeah, it was his first book. Yeah. I gave him a, I gave, you know, Steve his first blurb for the Amber Room, his first book. Yeah. And he came to me begging. <laughs> oh, Jim, please. I'm unpublished, and this is just coming out. Will you give me a blurb? But they'll, I'll graciously give you a blurb. <laughs> I gave him a blurb. The book came out, and he got another blurb from another author, uh, Dan Brown. <laughs> he obtained that before Da Vinci Code came out. So when Amber Room came out, you know, I loved it, Dan Brown. The back, you know, right above the little marker, they was like, I liked it too, James Rollins. Nothing to say, but it's exciting. I just want to share that. Yes. Uh, what's your favorite book in the Sigma series that you've written? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, it's like asking what your favorite kid is. You, know, you all have a favorite kid, you just don't say it. I uh, <laughs> have no kids. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like different books for different reasons. You know, uh, Map of Bones was the you know, where we spun it off out of Sigma, out of Sandstorm rather, so that was sort of exciting. Um, I really like Bloodline because that's where we see Tucker and uh, Kane for the first time. So that yeah. was really fun. I like doing the Western Mountain Grill that was in the Labyrinth. Uh, so each book has their own special reason. I'm like, I can't say I like one necessarily more than another. I'm going to go uh, here. Having had the pleasure of reading all of the Sigma series. Do you. Uh, you read them in order, by the way? Hmm? Do you read it by, by chance? Do you read them in order? I started about a third of the way in and then went back to the beginning and started to work my way up. And one thing that I noticed were the, per were the personalities involved because you see relationships right. grow and two daughters and you find uh, a father that is dementia and on and on and on. And on. Are these characters based on anyone particular that you know? Yeah, I'm always, you know, you always point threads from either your own life or other people's life. You know, my, my parents both had dementia, so you know, that was easy for me to relate to because you know, I was struggling with that, so it's easy to have Grace struggling with that. Um, but other parts of the story, you know, from other people, you know, I've had somebody that had that lost their hand. So surprisingly, mm -hmm. Monk lost his hand. Yeah. And one book, he grew it back and lost his other hand because I forgot his hand. <laughs> We're not going to say which error that is, but there's a book where that is. <laughs> Switched it accidentally. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's nice having a. It's one advantage of a series is that you can you can explore the, the a larger arc of a character's life than you can in just a single novel. So that's great deal of fun to do. Um, and I, I sort of have plotted out everybody's arc and where we land. You know, and back in Bone Labyrinth, you know, I hint a little bit about where some of these may land. I'm not going to tell you how they land, when they land, and I want you to keep reading. But it's like wonderful experiences, but they're old friends again. You know. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, because they are to me, too. I mean, I expect to be able to turn around the corner and see Gray. It's one of the reasons I have a difficulty playing that game of who do you think should play Gray in a film, mm -hmm. uh, or who should play Shishan, or because to me, I, I know exactly what Gray looks like. I know exactly what Shishan looks like. Um, so if I start thinking of them as an actor, I'm afraid I'm going to start then picturing them as that actor, because that happened to me. I mean, when I read Harry Potter, there was no movies. And so I Harry Potter formed in my head. And then I watched the movies. And I go back and read Harry Potter, and all I can see is Daniel Radcliffe. <laughs> and so I don't want to erase Gray. So I have to say, I like you guys are playing it, but I don't like to paint myself. Because they're like, so they're like part of the family. How much time do you spend writing nowadays versus book tour, marketing, blogging? Book tours aren't that much. I mean, pretty much I'm on the road. Like, for this book, you're, you're my last book signing stop on this tour. So I've been on the road for two weeks. So this, this is about typical. Usually I'm on the road about two weeks for a book. And then otherwise, I'm, it's, I'm just me writing the rest of the year. A typical day uh, is a, 
back when I had my clinic, I, I made a commitment. I told you before, I wrote three double space pages, five out of seven days of the week. I don't know if I ever get rid of my day job. I'll be much more productive than I am, of course. Five pages. So I hit a wall, five pages. It takes me about an hour to write a page. Five new pages is about five hours of new writing. I get sort of burnt out about that point, and that's then I do, after that I'll do research. Uh, I will I will play a little bit on Facebook. I swear, <laughs> if, I did, if Facebook was never existed, I would have at least another book done every year. <laughs> <laughs> and the business side of writing too, is tossed in that day. But otherwise, you know, I'll, I'm locked in my office, and occasionally once a year they unleash me from my collar and let me run around the corner, like, around the country, like, grab, grab a dog, and then, once I'm tired out, they back in there, back up there. <laughs> I'm going to go to you. Uh, are you optioning any books coming up? <sighs> um, watch James Rowan. It's delicately around the answer to this. Um, I'm not legally allowed to answer your question. <laughs> but strangely, I'll be spending a good chunk of January in LA. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> interpret that however you want. <laughs> I may have problems with that whole gray issue. <laughs> good luck with it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I'm going to go to you. So I have a question for you. Is your work spans? So many um, areas of science, and they're pretty cutting edge. I actually, you know, you mentioned this reading magazines, but I actually wondered if you spend a lot of time perusing a lot of a lot of scientific journals because oh, you go course. from XNA to M State to Damascus Steel and Nanotech to electric oh. microbes, and and you seem to have a very good grasp of the the depth of the science. And I just I wondered if you I actually thought maybe you you know you had a staff of people that. Peruse journals. No, just me. Uh, people ask me for it. I love to research, and it's a problem because sometimes I'm, I have to fall into a trap of keep researching and never writing. Uh, so my new obligation to myself, a new commitment, is that I've only allowed myself to research 90 days, 90 first day I have to write. But I'm also a lazy researcher, and I'd rather have to call people because you're right. Books are old. Uh, you generally, the information in a book is, is years old. Mm -hmm. Even book that appear, even information in a uh, you know peer reviewed. Journal is, is months old, if not even older. So I prefer to call a scientist on whatever topic and say, hey, you know, look over your shoulder and tell me what you're working on now. Now, for this book, I had five entomologists on speed dial. Okay. And Tara, I'm sure they were like, James Rollins, lose our number, please. <laughs> we have to get work done, We're constantly calling us. Uh, so it's, it's helpful. It helps me because science changes very rapidly. And I've had this problem where I'm working on a novel and the science changes while I'm working on it. And then I've got to go in and keep tweaking it because I'm changing the science on the fly because the science is changing on the fly. So rather than you know waiting to get old information that, that's going to change more rapidly, I'd rather get as, as, you know, as current to the you know, right behind the shoulder of that scientist as I can. Also cheap. <laughs> I'll give you a little, there's a little trick of writing I'll show you this so you know, but it's what a uh, bad writer I'm <laughs> it may look like I know a lot about a subject. There's a, a trick called the telling detail, where if I just get enough details correct, you start believing I know much more than I do. And I'll use this example. You know, let's say Gray and company are in Kuala Lumpur, and Gray has a sudden need for a caffeine fix. So he's going to go to Starbucks. So I go to Starbucks website and go, where's Starbucks and we'll Kuala Lumpur? Okay. I put that location in the book. If you ever been to Kuala Lumpur, you go, oh my gosh, there really is a Starbucks. And I <laughs> because I got that detail correct, you believe that there's telepathic marsupial creatures that live up in the I know where Starbucks was. So if you get enough of those details correct, there is sometimes the appearance of knowledge, but it really isn't. It's putting enough to make it work. Yes. Um, you learn so much in your research, and you mentioned you have friends within Homeland Security and DARPA and so on and so forth. And part of the lovely thrill of your books is that we can be scared to death, but no, we're really safe. Um, do you find out things that really scare you to death? Not so much that scare me to death as 
I had this question asked recently. Is actually, I, I, I love that. Because then I'm thinking, well, that's a great story. It's like when I paint my characters in the corner, I like painting in the corner because I don't, if I don't know how to get them out, neither are you. So that's a good corner. That's a good trap. Same with these ideas. And sometimes they'll tell me some stuff that is scary. But my mind instantly goes to not like, oh, no, will I die? My mind goes, how, do we get how can I make that a cool story? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's, you know, besides making you feel safe, it makes me feel safe. Because I, uh, you know, I can work through my concerns about that topic by building this big roller coaster and then having it uh, you know, land safely at the, uh, where we mm -hmm. call it, thing that, that roller coaster stop at. What, you, what is that word? Junction. Okay. I'll look it up. <laughs> Ask me next year. You've been helping me up a lot. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, what are you working on right now? I'm, I'm, working on I'm assuming it's not a Sigma Force book. It's oh no, it's all, my next Sigma Force book is almost done. Oh, okay. You usually want the book done. You know, generally they want it. In the, my editor wants it in her hand about eight months before publication. Oh, and, and well, you were saying two books a year. I just thought maybe you might be do, going into. Uh, oh yeah. What, uh, what else is coming next year? Is there? I'm doing. I'm, I'm cheating a little bit in that there's an anthology coming out next year, next, next summer. It has all my short stories. Oh, are all going to be one oh, volume. Uh, so right now they're spread everywhere. There are different anthologies, some ebooks, some yeah. different collections. They're all in one spot. But I don't want to sell you old stuff, so I wrote a 140-page mini novel uh, featuring Tucker and Kane. So that's yeah. going to be something new to, to add to that volume. So that's coming out then, then soon next year. I, and I wanted to thank you. You're usually the only main sort of big author that ever tours in December. So you get uh, uh, almost because I start in, in Phoenix. Well, no, no, it's just that <laughs> nobody that tours. <laughs> nobody tours in December. Nobody has. I've never understood this. Christmas is in December. Hanukkah is in December. Great present, you know. But you're the only one. You seem the only one. Books make great presents. I'm the only they one do. out there. Uh -huh. They do. We have only one choice. We have yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. And then. Finally, I'm sorry, is yes. one of the great things about your books, especially this one after I finished re reading it, is in the back, truth or fiction. Yeah, right. It's yeah. always a learning experience. You go, damn, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yes, so, I put those in there not for your benefit, sir. Those <laughs> <laughs> are my benefit. I'm glad you're enjoying them. But I started doing that because I would feel a thousand questions. I mean, you feel like my earlier books are not, it's not there. Mm -hmm. I went later did I start doing that, and the reason why is I was just answering, you know, hundreds of emails. A lot of times the same question, is this real, is that real, is that, you know, what's, so rather than answering hundred emails the same question, I'm just going to, just going to put it in the back of the book. And also it's because of a one-star Amazon review. I get one-star Amazon review, but this one really pissed me off. <laughs> it was, you know, Jim, uh, you know, I was enjoying Jim's latest novel, I was really enjoying it, and I got to, well, this one part of the story, and it, Come on, it was just, I just couldn't accept it. It was just too far. I just couldn't finish it. One star. I look at the review, I'm going, yeah. that's the true part. <laughs> <laughs> I been, I'm taking you somewhere weird. <laughs> what tripped you out of that story is true. <laughs> so rather than, you know, I couldn't ever reach him, so I thought I was going to start putting it at the back of the novel. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, I like to read the breadcrumbs. So if anybody has an interest in the history of the science, I'll leave the breadcrumbs. You had a question. I'm sorry, sir. Keep if you don't mind speaking a little bit more on your process, once you have your five pages, yes. How much editing do you do on that? Are you do intensive editing or not so much or varies or? Uh, you know, I, I belong to the same. I, belong, I joined a critique group back when I was starting to look. To, when I was writing those short stories that were buried in my backyard, I'm still with that same critique group. So they've read all my stuff from next year already. Uh, so I run it through the group. And I'm little chunks, and they give me feedback. There's 12 of them from different fields and different, you know, different sources. And so I'd like to get their feedback first. So I incorporate that during the edit. I call it a rolling edit, and then I'll go forward, go back, edit, roll forward, go back, edit, roll forward. Until by the time I'm done, it's fairly where I want it to be. I'll do about one month of just the final tweaking and polishing and, and reviewing some of the facts, to make sure they're still, they're still accurate, that science hasn't changed, or there's not new information that can make it even cooler. And then I turn to my editor. Uh, and that takes about a month to... I hate editing with my editor. I love her, but... I've had the same editor... The, the editor that pulled me out of that slush pile, or subterranean, the same editor who edited this. It's very rare to have the same editor throughout your entire career, but it's great to have her. Um, but the first step process of that stage is what's called the edit's letter. It's the big things that are wrong with your novel. 
fundamental structural things. I hate that letter. <laughs> it causes panic attacks. <laughs> it's like, you know, Jim, the Sigma Force is really cool. And, and Commander Greg Pierce, interesting character. But what if he was a Girl Scout? <laughs> Can you make that change for us, please? Ooh, okay, well, that's, gonna, that's more than just some tweaks. <laughs> so those are the, the then get then it's line editing, then there's a page proofs, and then by the time it's done, I, I want to see it. I never want to look at that book again. It's a long part, a lot of editing. Yes, sir. In uh, your book, you have a military retiree, or still in the military, somewhat. You have an animal, a dog. I like this story, you know, wherever you put them at. Mm -hmm. But I'm interested in the command to a dog. And yes. How much? Can you explain some of the? I mean, he gives a lot of commands, and that dog does. And it's based on. Those are based on fact. My, what we're, he's asking about my my character King. He's a military war dog. He's paired up with his uh, his handler, uh, an army ranger named uh, D D Tucker. And uh, you know, I. I, I discovered that pair of characters when I did a, a UFO tour to Iraq and Kuwait in the winter of 2010. Veterinarian, dogs. Okay, play with your dogs. They're, yes, but you're going to lose a hand. I'm okay with that. Uh, and so I talked to the handlers and I found out you know, exactly what those dogs can and can't do. Uh, I went to Lackland Air Force Base where they trained them. I talked to the, to the trainers out there to find out exactly what they, what they do. And I want to try to, as you know, those that have read the novels, you know, I, I have points of view from this side of the, of the leash from the from the army ranger, but also from this side of the leash, dog play. I didn't want to do a Disney version of the dog, but the dog breaks out in song halfway through the novel. <laughs> I wanted to make it as epic as I could. So I wrote, you know, uh, he first appears in, in Bloodline in, in a short story where I was trying to practicing that. Then I joined with Grant, who has a military background. He can bring more authenticity when we did the, the two books in that series, the two books so far. Um, the first book, I had handlers. I had five handlers. I had them review the novel after I finished it. And they go, yeah, you know, this this is authentic. Uh, I just had a handler at another sign just yesterday. that said, you know, I read that. It's really cool. They were so accurate with what these dogs can do. But the, across the board, five handlers, when I wrote uh, Kill Switch, said, uh, you know, it's a beautiful job with Kane. But if anything, they could do more. You're pulling the reins back on what they can really do. And most people will read and go, gosh, you're making a lassie out of these dogs that can't possibly do that. But the handlers will say, no, they can do more. So in the next book, I actually then took some of their notes and expanded what, what Kane can do to be more authentic to what those dogs' abilities are. Yes? Uh, so a couple things. I have a Shepherd Dane protection trained animal. 150 pounds. 150 pounds. Very much similar uh, to Kane. Um, I can give him a command, he'll climb a ladder. Um, my questions for you, well really my only question for you is, end of your day, you've written your five pages, you don't have to talk to your editor, what's in your glass? <laughs> I, I, I brew beer more, for a living, I was, so I wish that's the more exciting answer is usually it's, it's, a, it's a rock star energy drink. I think that a rock star should die. I should have like a jacket with like rock star symbols on it. Like race cars. Easy Bono. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't drink a lot of alcohol to be honest with you, but uh, mostly just uh, rock stars. Yeah. But yeah, you know, my dogs are very talented too, just like that. When I say get off the furniture, they don't. <laughs> but they understand what I'm asking. <laughs> yes. They know you don't want them. Yeah, I know. You can ask as many as you want. Did you have the same editor since since you began? Yes. What would happen if you went back to her and said, I want to re revive or go back to uh, excavation? Yeah, like change it or, I mean, or do, do a sequel? Do a sequel to it. Oh, uh, they'd probably be okay with that. Or subterranean. My house is subterranean very... Subterranean is used as a classic... Oh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a whole sequel for yeah. to subterranean already... Uh, Written. It's wow. called Subterranean. We're going deeper. <laughs> <laughs> they're very, they're very, uh, they allow me to do different things. They know, you know, as long as I give them a single book a year, I can, I can play with other things. They're, they're pretty cooperative for the most part. I mean, they'll bring me in at some point, you know, but they mostly let me, let me do whatever I want. Subterranean reboot. Whoa. It's some cool stuff they have. 
they're 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 I do. I mean, I, I've got another, I, I have a whole other st story for Lorna Polk, who was featured in, in Altar of Eden. I do know exactly what I would do with, with book two of, of Subterranean. I do I have any idea what I'd do for book two of Amazonia. But, uh, but as, you, as those that have read my Sigma no novels know I have a tendency to pinch characters out of those standalones and then pull yeah. out. Cole also came from Ice Hunt. Yeah. Yep. 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 It doesn't really belong in Sigma. I have any Not the brightest bulb out there, but. <laughs> He's I put him in there anyway, the <laughs> so I liked him and missed him, and you know, so it depends. I just wish I could clone myself. But there's many stories I wish I could get around to writing. I just write that. So I was wondering, you mentioned some of your earlier books, you know, subterranean and excavation, Amazonian, and there was that group early on, and then you kind of went sort of the the dark military techno, and I just wonder what sent you down that path. Are you ex-military? No. I came on that path. I mean, most of the books had some type of yeah, military. Bit, I mean, like yeah. Deep Fathom had a you know a, a former Navy SEAL. Mm -hmm. um, but when I wrote Sandstorm, I didn't think it was the beginning of the Sigma Force universe. I just invented the Sigma Force team, liked them. I began a lot of pressure for my house to do a series because series sells better. Just from, so they say, do a series, do a series. And so I don't want to do a series. I might do these individual adventures. They're fun. To do a series. <laughs> so I wrote Sandstorm and I thought, hey, I like Sigma, this would have cool. And I was, one of the problems I had, I, I mentioned this before, I think, with this group, I mean, apparently I didn't tell you the Matoclus one. <laughs> Why I didn't want to do a series is what I call the Jessica Fletcher syndrome. Jessica Fletcher from Murder She Wrote. <laughs> that old woman's always stumbling over dead bodies. <laughs> <laughs> I've never stumbled over a dead body. <laughs> what is yeah. wrong with that woman? that little village. What is wrong with that woman? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they res my only satisfactory, satisfactory resolution to that series should have been the revelation that Jessica Fletcher was a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> She's been framing people this entire time. Then, then, the then it makes sense. So yeah, it strains to have that much mischief happening to an individual and a serious character. But also, you know, if somebody puts a gun against Jessica Fletcher's head in an episode, as much as you might want them to pull the trigger, they never do, because she's in next week's episode. So it's hard to maintain a level of jeopardy, because you're, not, you know, you're never going to pull that trigger, so you never really feel threatened. So I thought, well, if I build a series based on a group, then the jeopardy comes from many different directions, everybody's at risk, because uh, Sigma can always, you know, recruit a new member if I knock off somebody. So once I got around that Jessica Fletcher syndrome, uh, I thought this is cool. I can play with different sciences. I can I can build big adventures with this group. So then I got past that that little uh, issue I had. Yeah, and retire somebody too. Exactly. <laughs> so so that's, that became. The single series, then, like I said, then I do something else. But I do like to stretch my literary leg, so uh, you know, besides doing this military, you know, then I do a, you know, a book featuring a, a, a veterinarian or you know, something with the, the war dogs or a vampire series, just to do something different the other part of the year. Yes, sir. A serious question about, you had an article in Free Magazine, I believe, yes. about dogs and chocolate? And... That was in Costco. Okay. Yes, so again, it was, I wrote a little article. Uh, about you know, the holiday hazards for your pet for Costco magazine and what it was about chocolate because chocolate is very toxic I don't know how many times I've had dogs walking with something vomiting hot chocolate all over my exam room table chocolate is very toxic to dogs and cause arrhythmia and pancreatitis and all sorts of issues so there's a list of just things you should watch out for and again dogs chew dogs and cats are very attracted towards uh, all these new power cords running around the things so they chew on them. They get a lot of electric mouth burns and electrical burns during that time of year. And cats eat tinsel and they cause linear body obstruction. So they, you know, they asked me. So I just wrote an article about how it happens. It's fun writing something different like that. Like, yeah, you can write about pets. <laughs> not like, what's your writing problem? <laughs> More chocolate, little one? <laughs> So you're still practicing? Is that feral cats you're working on? Just feral cats. I don't, I don't practice full time. I just do that volunteer work. It's one Sunday month for eight hours. That's my extent of my veterinary career now. Which we have feral cats 
<laughs> oh, it's interesting that you know, our, our summer weather is a lot nicer than Sacramento. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, the, you know what we do with you know those, those kit those cat colonies are, are they're kit factories. They just produce out kittens. They're vectors for disease. So by doing the spay-neuter program to try to offset that, we also then have a new program where we actually take feral cats and if somebody's having you know rat problems and we'll fix them and we'll release them in an area where there's rat problems and so we have them they pay us so we get help finance some of our cost of our work so working cats very nice exactly. working dogs exactly <laughs> anybody else yes sir do then they pay you to remove the feral cats afterwards <laughs> I look back um, to science and technology. There's sure. a bunch of stuff going on these days. Uh, do you have any anything that caught your eye? Maybe just for maybe for a book or maybe just for yourself. Oh yeah, I mean like so I got that box. It's full of stuff. That's really cool. I'll give you just one hint of the next book. It's not the science, but actually history. Uh, the next thing, the novel that's coming out next year. Uh, I'll give you a little, a little taste of the history that comes out of that novel. That and this is true. Uh, there actually is a Catholic patron saint, St. Colombo of Spain, a Catholic patron saint of witches. Not against witches, but in support of witches. How is weird that the Catholic faith has a saint that actually protects witches? How weird is that? We'll find out next week. <laughs> Anybody else? Basic. Who's your favorite character? Or favorite character to write? Ah, oh, favorite character to write. I mean, I like writing the villains because then I get to do dastardly deeds and get to play them. So that's always fun to do. But, you know, I, I recruited Kowalski from Ice Uncle. I love Kowalski, so I go back. <laughs> so I like, you know, I like writing Kowalski. It's a lot of fun. Do you have a question? Oh, I could go for out now. <laughs> I can just carry it on if you want. So do you have a, a favorite book based on your subject matter that, that you just found? You know, the topic one, itself? One of my research books, you mean? Well, you know, no, any of your books. Just they, they, Like I said, they span so many areas of science. And I just wondered, well, you mentioned Lorna Polk. She's a veterinarian. Right. I just wondered if, if there's one that you, you know, maybe identify with. With that, because she's a veterinarian, or just based on the subject matter that you wrote, it like, was oh, fun, this is my you favorite. Know, writing, you know, you know, a lot of lawyers become novelists. Not too many veterinarians <laughs> become novelists. I think James Harris is probably the last one of the veterinary mm -hmm. field. That, 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 most of the lawyers hate their job, so they're looking for something else to do. <laughs> veterinarians love our job, so not too many have strayed from the fold, except for me and Claire Landis on the way back. So it was, it was fun being able to write. Mm -hmm. With the veterinarian at least, that was a lot of fun. And then, I can't say one thing I like more than another. Uh, each thing is fresh and new, and that's what I enjoy. I mean, when I plot, I know the beginning, I know the end, I know a few stopping points in between, but I don't know how A connects to B connects to C before it's done right. Because to me, it's that discovery that, that's the fun part. That's how I end up painting the characters in the comic. I'm not sure where I'm going sometimes, and they end up in a jam I never would have you know, pre-plotted or thought of. So. I can't believe I get paid for this. <laughs> I still have to spend a at any point. This is actually the real reason I do that Spain Neuter Clinic is when somebody realized Jim Grown really can't write. What's he doing? Pick up that scalpel, get back to work. <laughs> Nothing's playing around business. Yes? Um, like growing up, did you have a particular genre you like to read, like sci-fi, mystery, anything like that? When you're everything. Growing, just everything. I mean, and mostly I should say that everything. Genre fiction. Uh, I liked I liked science fiction, horror, mysteries. I liked spy novels. I liked uh, army, military type of stuff. And that's why yeah, you get all of us in there. here. Yeah. <laughs> when you know, I was with the same editor all along, but I never met her until eight books later. Uh, eight books after I, the Harper Collins published with me, they finally invited me to New York. And you know, you go to New York with a big giant monolith tower of Harper Collins and the top is Darth Vader. It felt that way. <laughs> <laughs> and I go up to the this is the first time I meet everybody at Harper Collins. They invite me to come over and meet meet the staff. And so I go into the top of the tower, this large boardroom. Everybody's there's packed. You know, there's the sales department, the marketing department, there's the art department, there's the Paperback sales is foreign division. Um, at the end of the table is the head of HarperCollins. And he stands up and goes, hey, Jim, 
have one question for you. Number one. Can you tell us what you write? We're not sure. Yeah. <laughs> because I do have a tendency to blend so many yeah. genres. They were really it's like, well, you published it in my novel. I was hoping you could answer that for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming you're putting my book in a bookstore somewhere, right? I'm sure they're shelving it somewhere. <laughs> I assumed it was fiction, but so. And I thought subterranean was, was science fiction. Science fiction. I always thought it was science fiction. Because I, I have telepathic marsupial creatures up in the underneath an arm. Yeah. <laughs> and I turn it into a listen. She goes, no, we're going we're gonna to market this as a thriller. Uh, yeah. I mean, what about the telepathic marsupial creature that was going in that Yeah, but you're saying it in present day. Yeah. Oh, so? Does that make it real? That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Michael Crichton can do it. I guess I can. So I'm right at the beginning of your Sigma Force series. Do you have any ventriloquists coming up later on? <laughs> I don't want to ruin any surprises. Do <laughs> <laughs> you have a question? Um, so, you know, you, you've written some media tie-in stuff. Are there any universes or sandboxes that you love to play in, or are there any universes that Sigma Force you can see is a shared universe with some other oh, that's a, thing? I've never asked me that question before. Now, I did the Internet Jones tie-in because I love the Internet Jones, and I will only do it if I'm passionate about it, and I was a huge raider and indie band, so to be Captain the Shogun say, would you want to do this? And like, yeah. Uh, is there anything else I would really want to do? <coughs> You know, there was a, a, a series on television called Farscape. You remember Farscape? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so at one point, out, they, they offered me to write a novelization, uh, not, not, write a novel in that universe, and I said yes. And then they then they canceled the series. Mm -hmm. I said maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> but again, be, I can't wrap the top of my head of what that would be that I would really want to write in. What's going to have so many obligations as it is? Um, I don't know. I just think about that. A better answer. That dull answer. Anybody else? <laughs> yes. Do you travel to a lot of the places that you write about prior to it? Not all of them. I did a, a, a spreadsheet when Sandstorm came out. This is several books ago. Mm -hmm. Where I wrote down every place that I wrote about and checked mark off if I had been there. At that point, like 70% of the places I had been uh, and traveled to. But I generally very rarely actually travel for research. I don't like saying, I'm going to set a story in Paris, fly over to Paris, run around Paris, come back and write about it. I just I go to town in Estonia eight years ago, buy this in a shop. I didn't dig this out of a mine of that adventure. So. Oh, that's pretty. I'll take that. Let's get a look at it. Uh, when I travel, I take a bunch of pictures. When I was in Tallinn, uh, Tallinn was not bombed uh, during World War II, so it's, it's a medieval part of the town. It's still intact. Beautiful medieval. Took a bunch of pictures. They were, they were remodeling the library. Took a bunch of pictures. What's featured in this book? The medieval section of the city and the library because I had pictures. And I journal when I travel. I generally have like a little diary where I just describe what I'm seeing a little bit, and I just shelve it. And then, you know, at some point, if my characters have to be wandering in that vicinity, or I learn something about that town or village that's really cool, then I put my box, then I'm set to go. So that's where I do most of my. Very rare, I think maybe like twice, I've actually flown somewhere and done research specifically for a topic. You know, I've been to Smithsonian many, many times, but it, it's the first time I have 13 books in the universe that I'm actually writing a story about that. So after 13 books, do you have an uh, end point in mind for how far the Sigma series is going to go? I don't. Or is it just going to keep going? At this point, you know, I know the big arcs of the major characters. I just don't know when they're going to, when those uh, balls are going to drop for these different characters. Um, so I don't have an end date at this point. Besides just knowing that I know where this character is heading, I just don't know when they're going to get there. Do you think maybe like a, a, a future novel, like, I mean, or is it all going to be like present day, like the Sig Sigma Force in the future, perhaps? I no, I think we'll, we'll just stick sequentially to the story. <laughs> there we go. That would be a big jump in that. Yeah. I'll be up here signing books. Thank you very much for coming out. I encourage people to pick up this. It's surprising how light uh, amber is. Yeah, you know, you can tell Bill Amber, you can make amber. <laughs>